So um, for those of you who, who know me, I'm kind of obsessed about efficiency and hence this is why I've sort of chosen this topic on lessons learned and I always like hearing other people's lesson learned because I really don't want to make um, the same mistake again. I don't want other people to make the same mistake if you can call them mistakes. So uh, I did, um, it all fit into a one double-sided page so I did make a few copies of my presentation so if the folks who have them could just start them circulating. If you think you can use it, feel free to take one. Um, yeah, you can just get them started, yeah. And so I'll jump right into it. So um, first off, the Watershed Management Plan is available on the BRBC website. So if you, it's a good starting point if you're starting into your own Watershed Management Plan to get a copy and, and see what's in there. It'll give you some good ideas. In terms of the background, we started with um, a State of the Watershed report in 2005. There was actually a State of the Watershed we did in 1993. Uh, that was a precursor to this one. So this was our second one for the Bow River Basin Council. Then we did the Bow Basin Watershed Management Plan. Uh, we called it Phase 1 originally. And, and then we decided to go with this naming format where we call them after the year that they're anticipated to be completed. We thought that was cleaner. Um, so Phase 1 uh, focused on water quality and water quality objectives. Uh, then in 2009, we uh, did a future planning priorities project. And this was, I guess, one of the lessons learned as well. During phase one, we had selected water quality as our topic, and we ran into a few bumps along the way where a couple of uh, key individuals felt that water quality shouldn't be the first priority topic. Uh, they had other ideas in mind. And so we spent a lot of time um, trying to figure that out, making sure that water quality was our highest priority, and we did agree that yes, it is our highest priority, and we proceeded. But we spent some time sort of going, getting through that bump. So then we decided, well, let's identify the future planning priori priorities over the next five to seven years, and that way, people, if you're, you know, if, if you're concerned about groundwater quantity, you can see where it's going to come in the planning schedule. So you. You'll know that your idea is coming up or your key area of emphasis. Then in 2010, we did a State of the Watershed. This time we did an online State of the Watershed and prepared a short summary document as well. And then um, in 2010, we actually started Bow Basin Watershed Management Plan 2012, which focused on four key areas, headwaters, land use, wetlands, and riparian areas. And that was from that future priorities <coughs> report. These were identified as our priorities. And it's a very ambitious bunch of topics, but we felt they were all so intertwined that it made sense to do them together. And for these, uh, the Bow Basin Watershed Management Plans, I served as a project <coughs> coordinator for both phases. Uh, hence, that's, that's my reason for the presentation today. So, at a similar conference about eight years ago, I had the was able to go for a short walk with Hans Schreier from University of British Columbia. And this is before we were starting phase one of the Bow Basin Watershed Management Plan. And he provided this advice to me. He said, for your first attempt at watershed management planning, pick a topic that is manageable because most importantly, you want to ensure a success. And then he said, once you have the success behind you, your confidence and trust will be there and you can go wherever you want. And I always remembered that. And I think it's a particularly important for new uh, WPACs or WSGs that are, that are starting out on a watershed management planning process to keep that in mind. You don't, you don't have to necessarily try and tackle everything in your first phase of a watershed management plan. Determine your priorities and then go forward with your priorities and try and get that first success, that first win. Very important. So uh, the next thing is a uh, strong terms of reference is critical. Uh, you need to identify what you will do, what you will not do, how you will do it, who will be involved, reporting relationships, and timelines. The other area, uh, everyone's familiar with the terms of reference, but a lot of people don't think about the operating principles. So for the steering committee and the technical committee and the implementation committee, set down who, what, where, when, and why for those various committees and how new members will be accepted. So if you're part way through the process and someone indicates they'd like to join, you should have that set out in advance, what the process is and how you determine if you accept new members part way through the process. 
you want to determine the approximate amount of time for the committee and the committee members. And, um, and you want to set things like, ideally set things like meeting dates. If it's going to be the third Thursday of every month, lay that out so people are really clear on what's expected of them. And other things, what consensus is, how you define consensus and what you do if you can't reach consensus. Uh, management of the process is critical. Uh, you need individuals or an individual to work specifically to keep things moving. Uh, you need to anticipate what needs to be done and take action to make it happen. And this needs to occur throughout the project. Uh, ideally, it, two or three people, sort of a small working team would be ideal, where you have one person entirely in charge, sort of a project coordinator, and a couple of people who are actively there bouncing <coughs> ideas off with the project coordinator. And the majority of the work needs to occur between meetings, not just a few days before. As, as you quite often, you get the sense in some projects that there wasn't a lot of thought given about to the next meeting until frantically a few days before and then everybody's rushing. The, the other thing I would suggest is establish a technical committee for each new phase. So if your first phase is water quantity, Get the best experts you have in your area on water quantity and related topics and form a clear technical committee with a, you know, the year time frame or whatever to come out and help develop some of the actions and management uh, recommendations. In some cases you may want to consider alternatives. Uh, if you have sort of a science committee as part of uh, your WPAC, for example, you may want to consider that, but if you do, make, be very clear on what their role will be because if they're just used to meeting every third month and suddenly they're expected to meet every month and they have a lot more take home uh, work and effort to do, they may not be prepared for that. So just make it very clear. In the case of the Bow Basin Watershed Management Plan, we didn't have a technical committee and that was I, I think our, <coughs> our biggest um, thing that I would do different if I did it again. Uh, we, we were trying to use an existing committee, but we just couldn't gain traction. So uh, again, if I did it again, the steering committee, we had about 14 to 16 individuals on the steering committee. I would have split the steering committee, had 8 to 10 on the steering committee, taken the other 8 or so individuals, added a few more, and made a steering committee and a technical committee. Maybe the steering committee meeting meets every second month, and then technical committee every month. And then consider alternative methods for planning and getting ideas. So I was at a loss because I didn't have a technical committee and I needed people that I could bounce ideas off of, the more sort of technical folks. So this was really surprising, but with a week's notice, well first off, at the steering committee level, we suggested 28 names of individuals who could provide sort of more technical advice on the watershed management plan at the stage where we were developing draft uh, actions and recommendations. So um, with a week's notice, I set up a half day, two half-day conference calls with these technical experts. And I had almost 100% involvement. So these very busy people were willing to sit down for half a day on a conference call and, and provide their advice into these management actions. So I sent them out the draft version and they came back and said, this is a good recommendation. This one could be strengthened. This one we question its efficacy. And so very useful. Uh, a few quick, quick uh, lessons learned. Keep the terms of reference as short as possible. Um, and particularly when they're going out to municipalities and things like that, you don't want to overwhelm them. So if you have an appendices as part of your terms of reference, I'd suggest separating them into the actual terms of reference, which might be just five to eight pages, and then the longer appendices. Separate them as separate files, because people get overwhelmed if they see any file that is about 30 pages or longer. So keep it very short and precise as possible. Uh, flip chart notes are very important. We hel held a couple of workshops, and I'll talk about those later, but I asked the group to give me their top five priorities at the end of the workshop. And um, I remember at the end of it, I take home the notes to see them or take them back to the office. And the top priority for one of the groups on wetlands or riparian areas was management. Just one <laughs> word. And then so I'm at a total loss of, of what to do with that. So fortunately I was able to find out who was facilitating that session and get the information. 
But it's, you know, if you're going to the effort of putting on a workshop, make sure it's, it's very clear to the facilitators that you need full sentences for the top priorities. Uh, one thing we could have done more of is take the time to fully evaluate the actions. And all of this just takes time, but we ended up with uh, a large number of actions in the Bow Basin Watershed Management Plan. And there was hesitancy among members to sort of get rid of any of the actions because they were all important. So you could really use some sort of process where you can help evaluate which are truly the top priorities. Uh, also take the time to fully understand the linkages between watershed plans and other plans such as regional plans. Uh, they were just evolving at the time that we were working on the regional plan so this was new for us. You want to actively involve the standing committees uh, in the planning process to the best of your ability. Like you may have an education and communication standing committee, a legislation and policy, those type of groups. Involve them as best you can in the process. But when you do this, be sure to communicate to these groups well in advance what your intentions are and, and make sure they're comfortable with their given role and they're given a, a good heads up. We, I don't think we gave our standing committees enough time um, we didn't give them enough heads up that, oh, here comes a draft version of the plan in this month. Set aside some time on your schedule to look this over and give us some input. So that would be one thing we'd do different. Uh, one thing we did really well was encourage an open process. Uh, anyone could have, could be on the distribution list for the steering committee. Anyone could be. So if you didn't have time to commit to the project, but you still wanted to be involved, just People could just send me their email, I'll add them to the distribution list. And even though it's, it's a draft plan and development, people understand that and the recommendations are going to change. And that way if you see something that's not headed in the direction that you had hoped for, you can contact your member on the ste steering committee and pass on your views. You want to try and ensure on the steering committee and our technical committee that all of the key potential implementers are involved. So before you start, you'll know your theme or your key area you're focusing on. Try and determine who the implementers would likely be at the completion of this project and get them on your steering committee and technical committee from the start. It's very important. You also want to be clear on what you want to hope accomplish from your public engagement and communications program. Uh, for example, we did a, a survey with the Bow River Basin Council. Um, uh, but we did it later in the process and I think we selected a few uh, key recommendations and for each category and said, well, what do you think about these? And it was a, almost a little too detailed for the, for the more general audience. Uh, I think it might have been better time better spent if we had gone back to the outcome stage and helped get further input on the outcomes. That might have been a better time for a survey. And then there's general public workshops throughout the basin. You know, it's, it's almost just an expectation that you'll go out there and you'll hold general public workshops. But you really need to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve by these workshops? I know we, we typically do it, but in the case of the Bow River Basin Council, and I know it has been different with other WPAC, but we had very poor attendance <laughs> at these workshops. And the facilitator who was helping to coordinate them felt that it's because you're working on a watershed management plan. It's not a crisis type issue. You're, you're planning ahead. It's, it's not, a, not in your backyard type scenario. So people weren't as engaged. So we didn't get a lot of input from the general public. But the one thing we did was local decision maker workshops in three areas throughout the basin. We uh, set up some workshops and had the local decision makers come to those workshops. Very well attended and, and good information. The very best thing we did of all was two full day workshops that were held. The first one was to, uh, we had about 80 people involved and it was just a brainstorming session. We had some presentations in the morning on the four key themes and then we had a brainstorming session. No wrong answers. What, what do you think some potential management actions should be? That was superb. We got a lot of good ideas to help feed into the plan. Then we came back six months later and we showed them our early draft of what we've done with those management actions. We consolidated them and cleaned them up and we narrowed it down to our list of management actions. Again, 
we asked them for their input. What's good, what doesn't, do, doesn't work. And they broke into those four groups of headwaters, wetlands, riparian areas, and land use. Uh, again, for anyone who knows me, I, I'm also obsessed about implementation and the importance of implementation. Uh, the completion of the plan is really only the beginning. You should plan to spend, however long it took you to do your plan, you should plan to spend about an equal amount of time on implementation. Because that's, that's what really counts. And, and maybe it's not as fun and glorious as preparing a watershed management plan, but it's where the, you make the differences on the ground, so extremely important. You may also want to consider an implementation standing committee. Just, um, and you know, they may work really hard for the first two years after the plan is completed and then meet maybe every two times a year after that. But just still keep, keep moving, keep the pressure on and, and make sure that you're making progress with the recommendations. Otherwise, there's no point. The other thing to do is to celebrate success. And I'll just mention a, a story here with the Bow River Basin Council on our steering committee. As I said, we had 14 to 16 individuals turn up every monthly, every, every uh, third Thursday. And they did that for a little over a year. And then on the following Thursday, uh, Mark Bennett, the chair, or executive director of the BRBC, invited everyone out to a dinner. Um, and everything was the same, same meeting night and everything. And only two people were able to make it for the supper. So we wanted to celebrate success, but we weren't able to. But it, it really shows you the commitment of these individuals. They, they will show up at a meeting and drive for two hours or three hours to work on a watershed management plan, but you offer them a free supper and, well, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And so just to close, I'll go back to the, the quote from Hans Schreier. Once you have the success behind you, the confidence and trust will be there and you can go wherever you want. And I think that's uh, equally important. I hope these um, suggestions will help you as you guys enter your watershed management planning processes and implementation.